Hi, my name is Ron Rogers, and this video is titled Flight Test Tales from the Desert Chasing the F5E and the First Time I Saw Flutter. Now, these events were taking place out at the Air Force Flight Test Center in the mid to late 70s when I was a chase pilot out there at Edwards. And I got involved in chasing the F5E a lot. It was undergoing flutter testing and it uh, wasn't the most desirable mission. It started at six in the morning when the sun had just come up and the desert was still fairly calm because you don't want a lot of uh, disturbances, air disturbances when you're trying uh, to do high speed uh, flutter testing. Now things have come a long way since the early days of flight test and we have a lot better uh, instrumentation systems and procedures now. The F5E that I was chasing uh, was fully instrumented, and whenever we flew, we had a ground crew that uh, kept track of all the various parameters to see if uh, anything was going askew, if uh, we developed any flutter, any unusual accelerations, things like that. These aircraft were covered with accelerometers. And the particular test aircraft uh, contained two AIM 9s on the wingtips two 275-gallon tanks on the wing, and a centerline multiple ejector rack, a MER, that had five Mark 82s, which are 500-pound bombs. And this was the configuration. I was the chase pilot in a T-38, and we would take off at 6 in the morning, um, go right north of the base there, and conduct the test. And we uh, approached these test points in the hundredth of a Mach number. Now, this was a fairly quick test. Um, it was high speed, used up a lot of fuel. We had certain test points we wanted to get. We did them and we came back. And the bottom blue arrow is where I was parked as a T-38 chase at test stops. And the top blue arrow is where Paul was with his F-5E at Contractor's Row. It's somewhere around that upper blue arrow. I'm not exactly sure where it was uh, on this picture, but it's somewhere in the area. But the point is that we weren't side by side when we started the mission. We coordinated the start on the radio and we got very good at this, or I got very good at it, let's put it that way. We would tend to meet where the two taxiways came together, which at the time was the base of the tower, and I would just turn into the wing position and we would taxi out to the run-up pad there, or what the, air uh, what the Air Force calls last chance, we'd get the aircraft checked over and then we'd get cleared for takeoff, and away we'd go. Now, I did a bunch of these missions. We got very good at it. Paul and I um, worked very well together, and things were going fine. Well, one afternoon, I was doing a functional check flight, and uh, I mentioned this in another video. The canopy separated while I was doing 500 knots indicated because a forward uh, left latch was not uh, secured. Uh, nothing I could tell on the ground uh, because I couldn't check the tightness of the bolts. But it uh, took both my checklists off, blew my mask off. I got a bunch of uh, crap in my eyes and uh, uh, went into the flight surgeon um, after I landed. And they, uh, they cleaned a lot of that out, but they were kind of concerned about uh, if I had any issues with my eyes. So they, they took me off the schedule for about a week. And in that time, uh, they let some of the other test pilots come in and fly this mission. Well, lo and behold, they found out that in spite of it being early, it was a really fun mission to do. And I'm one of the junior pilots out there. And if the senior guys found out this was a good deal, uh, you know, that's kind of too bad for me. They're going to take it over. And, well, I knew the pecking order. Uh, uh, you know, there was no way uh, that I could challenge any of these guys. So um, uh, the mission kind of got away from me. Well. This went on for about a week, and uh, uh, Paul found out about it. And in the evening, we go out for a walk around the uh, the housing area and stuff like that, just because it finally cools off, and, uh, you know, we'd see everybody go around. Well, while I was out on the walk, I um, uh, we weren't home, and Paul left this uh, little note there. And I'd like to emphasize that it says, um, I talked to Steve Nagel. Steve was going to be the chase pilot and uh, told him not to show up Monday and uh, for me to fly it. Okay. And he un underlined for Steve not to show up. Well, 
that was kind of interesting and actually kind of awkward for me. Steve Nagel is on the bottom right side of the picture. Steve had just been selected to be a shuttle astronaut. So um, Paul chose me over a shuttle astronaut. Now, Steve was a much better pilot than I am. I, I'm not going to contest that in the least. Um, and uh, Dick Scobie is on the left there um, side. Dick and I flew together uh, many times. And, of course, he was on the ill-fated uh, Challenger mission. And up in the upper right, of course, is Ellison Onizuka. And he actually, his office was just a few doors down from mine in the test pilot school. So I'd run into uh, Ellison quite a bit. But anyway, these, these were the guys that were selected in that group, and Steve was one of them. And uh, I, I kept this note because it, it's kind of funny. You know, the, the reason I was uh, chosen um, over Steve flying was just because, and these are qualities that probably made me a pretty good airline pilot. I could be punctual. Uh, I showed up, and when we met at the base of the tower like that, it just clicked. And, and you know, I was trained on the mission, so... I knew what to do and Paul knew he could count on me and that's why it worked. And it wasn't terribly, it wasn't a terribly difficult mission at that. It was just, I'm setting off the side with a flight test engineer and we're kind of seeing, you know, what goes on. And, and we approach these, um, test points in the hundredth of a Mach number. Okay. So we're approaching in the hundredth of a Mach number. So you'd think, now well, you'd see if anything was going to go wrong because you'd expect to see that the dampening factors would would start to decrease because uh, what Paul would do is he would uh, give a stick pulse and and these were very high speeds we were transonic 0.98 and that and some some of the test points were supersonic but this this test point was still just barely uh, subsonic if you will the airplanes uh, in the transonic region of this but uh, the idea was you do a, a stick pulse a doublet in uh, pitch uh, roll and yaw and see what happens. And what we expected was we'd expect to see that the damping factors would be light, that the aircraft would start to get a little bit of oscillation. Well, even those, the, even though these points occurred in the hundredth of a Mach number, this thing from one hundredth of Mach number to the next took off. I had never seen an aircraft in my life become so loose the multiple ejector rack started going back and forth like this. The wingtips were doing this. The stabs there, the slabs were doing this. And I'd never seen anything become that loose. And it was just going all over the place. Well, I yelled terminate the same time the ground people yelled terminate. And I think Paul probably knew that something wasn't going right. Because uh, I think he could tell the airplane became very loose. And uh, we broke that off, slowed it down, of course. And uh, went back in. and. Uh, the engineers had to look that over for a while and uh, see what was going on, but uh, we certainly found a test point. And I ended up chasing the uh, the program, uh, the F-5, for a while longer, and uh, it was a lot of fun, even though you had to get up quite early. But um, it was a real fun mission. Thanks for watching.